Hello everyone, and welcome to the first Q&A of 2015. Before I begin with the questions, I first have a little bit of news to share, since Blizzard announced that they're going to publish some new lore, which is always a great thing. The announcement is the following. Hot on the heels of Blizzard Entertainment's 8 BlizzCon gaming convention, Dark Horse Comics is proud to announce a multi-volume series detailing the history of the Warcraft universe, World of Warcraft Chronicle. World of Warcraft Chronicle Volume 1 is a journey through an age of myth and legend, a time long before the Horde and Alliance came to be. This definitive tome of Warcraft history reveals untold stories about the birth of the cosmos, the rise of ancient empires, and the forces that shaped the world of Azeroth and its people. We often get questions from players who want to know more about the origins of the Warcraft universe and the rise and fall of their favorite characters, said Paul Sams, Chief Operating Officer of Blizzard Entertainment. This new series digs deeply into all of that, we can't wait for players to read it. This beautiful hardcover book features over 20 full-page illustrations illustrations by World of Warcraft artist Peter Lee and marks the first in a multi-part series exploring the Warcraft universe from the distant past to the modern era. This is an amazing project that will be absolutely irresistible to the legion of Warcraft fans. The people at Blizzard have been great to work with and we are extremely happy and proud to be working with them at a Dark Horse president, Mike Richardson. World of Warcraft Chronicle Volume 1 is on sale on November 4th, 2015 in comic shops and November 17th in bookstore. Pre-order your copy today. So it releases in November, which is still quite far away, but I'm very excited. Especially since they say that they will reveal untold stories about the birth of the cosmos and the rise of ancient empires, which I believe to be linked to the titans and the trolls. A lot of this lore has been kept in the dark so far, so it should be very interesting to read more about this. I can't wait for November, but yeah, we'll, we'll still have to wait a bit longer. So let's kill some time and start this Q&A, shall we? Starting off with a question from Wandkatak, who asks, Hey Nabo, love the videos. I was wondering what you think Refion is doing right now. We haven't heard a thing about him since War Crimes, right? Well, no, that's, that's not right, but the information is a little bit hidden. For those who haven't read War Crimes, what happened in that book was that they revealed Refion to be working together with Kairos Dormu and Garrosh. For some unknown reason, Refion wanted Kairos and Garrosh to go to this alternate Draenor, create the Iron Horde and get this expansion going. That's the last bit of information we got about him until you quest in the Spires of Arrak. There you find out that Admiral Taylor, he's built his own garrison, but something went horribly wrong. The garrison is a ghost town, everybody's murdered, Taylor is dead, he's been converted into this this undead skeleton being, uh, we take out this creature, we kill its creator, named Aphiel, and afterwards Taylor will join you as a follower if you're for the Alliance, and if you're Horde, that's just the end of it. Now this is all very mysterious, and we find more information on what happened in Taylor's log, which you find in a chest inside the garrison. Taylor, he describes some of the events that happened during his time on Draenor, and on day 7, the garrison, it was attacked by the Iron Horde. They were able to repel the attack, even though they lost a lot of good men, and during this assault, Ephiel he went missing for hours. Ephiel is, is the one that turned Taylor into this skeletal being. He was actually the one who betrayed Taylor, who killed all their crew, and somewhere in that time period he went over to the dark side and he turned into a necromancer. We're unsure which faction of the Iron Horde actually attacked the garrison. My first guess would be Gul'dan, but Taylor says that it was the Iron Horde. You could also say that Ner'zhul has something to do with it, especially with the whole necromancy thing going on, but Ner'zhul, he's based all the way in Shadowmoon Valley, and he was dealing with the Draenei at the time. Another guess would be the Shattered Hand Clan, since they're located in the Spires, but like I said, we're not sure what faction of the Iron Horde actually attacked. Now on day 12, we read that Sir Harris, he arrived in the town hall, and he had with him the Black Prince Refion. So Refion is confirmed to be on Draenor, but again, we're not sure what he's trying to do. He claims that he did something to cheese off the ogres, and now he seeks asylum in the garrison. They allow him in, Refion puts the guards on his payroll, he sends over some resources as a gift, and he even warns Taylor about a feel. On day 21, Taylor leaves the garrison to compete in a ring of blood and win some prize money for the garrison, and on day 27, when they return from all of this, they find out that the garrison is in chaos. 
chaos. Ephiel, he's handing out orders. Refion is nowhere to be found. And we can only guess what happened next, but the end result is pretty damn clear. Ephiel gave orders, he murdered the garrison, he, he resurrected everybody into spirits and undead, he took out Taylor, and we as the heroes, we go in and we clean up the mess. The final note in the book says that Refion, he took some of Taylor's best followers with him, so we're uncertain what he's currently doing. Perhaps Refion himself, he wanted to have his own little garrison, and perhaps he too wanted to get addicted to sending out followers on missions. Who knows what he's currently doing? It is very interesting though, you have to wonder why Refion, he wanted to work together with Kairos and Garros in the first place. His one motivation as an uncorrupted black dragon has always been to keep Azeroth safe. He doesn't really care what happens to us, he doesn't care about the factions, the whole alliance versus horde war, as long as the world remains intact, that's his main mission. Perhaps he imagined that the forces of the Iron Horde would be a solid fighting force to repel the Burning Legion. But then again in War Crimes, he did tell Anduin that one day he would like to stand together against the Burning Legion, so it doesn't really make sense for the Iron Horde to conquer Azeroth and then use it as a defense force. Perhaps the answer is that he took lessons from the Pandaren Innkeeper from Pandaria as a whole and he realized that the Alliance in the Hordes, they're strong because they were fighting each other for so long and maybe he figured that we needed a new challenge. Maybe he figured that the Iron Horde was a great force for the Horde and Alliance to unite against and have a new challenge, but who knows where Blizzard is going to take the story, who knows what Refion really wants, but we know for sure that Refion has been spotted on Drenor and perhaps we'll see him later on in the expansion. The next question is a bit long, so I'll shorten it down. Basically, for the branch, he asks, why are the warlords so ridiculously powerful, and shouldn't someone like Ural, who's a paladin, have a clear advantage against any ordinary warrior? This is one of the things that I get asked all the time. What class is the most powerful lore-wise? What enemy is the most powerful? What force is the biggest threat? Shouldn't certain characters easily defeat that character? And the simple answer to all of the questions is that someone's power in the story of Warcraft, it depends on what the story requires. You're absolutely right, there's no real lore reason given to the power of the warlords, except that they need to be powerful so that we can have a raid fight later on. Now in Blackhand's case, there might be more going on since his armor and all the lava, it hasn't really been explained yet, and it might show up later in the legendary questline, since we are going to discover Blackhand's secrets. But take Warlord Garrosh, for example, that fight was two against one, and if you do it on the alliance side, you actually have Ural as a paladin against Garrosh Garrosh and then one of the adventurers, there was no heart to empower him and this time apparently Garrosh he's so powerful that we couldn't take him on. But then someone like Thrall shows up and Thrall is apparently so powerful that Garrosh didn't even stand a chance. Wonderboy Thrall should just take care of everything in the future if he's really that powerful. But there are way more examples that you can think of. Like I said, power levels and advantages and who's the most bad guy and whatnot, that all depends on what the story requires. Next question comes from Rakalos. Hey Noble, do you think the quest givers in the inn are relevant lore-wise? If they are, what do you think of the Ebon Blade trying to get Bolvar off the Frozen Throne? Keep up the awesome vids. It's a tough question to answer since, on the one hand, we do see characters and storylines show up at the inn, but on the other hand, you have to wonder how much of an impact it makes on the overall storyline. Take the search for Illyria quest, for example. Lore-wise, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to find an artifact linked to Illyria on this alternate Drenor, and I doubt that they'll use an optional garrison building to introduce such a highly requested character. On the other hand, however, it, it does actually happen, and it is part of the story. If you chose that building, then these things actually happen. Now, for your example, you mean the quest with High Lord Mograine, and for those that haven't done this quest line yet, this is what it says. Though the Lich King has been defeated, we are no closer to unlocking the secrets of the Frozen Throne than we were when jousting pointlessly at the Argent Tournament. Bolvar remains resigned to his fate. Perhaps there's something here though that can aid us. Ner'zhul was not always the Lich King, you know. Once he was a mere orc dabbling in dark powers beyond his comprehension. Find whatever you can of his early studies and we may have our answers. And then the second time that you do the quest, it says the following. We have reviewed Ner'zhul's notes, which you brought to us previously. Though we are closer to understanding how these warlocks have learned to bind souls and control the undead, the picture is incomplete. We will need more pages if we are to see the whole picture. I do not want to experiment with partial information and create an abomination. 
There are enough of those in Northrend as it is. Now, as cool as it is to see Mograin in action again, the quest itself, it doesn't make a lot of sense to me. It's true that Ner'zhul, in our reality, he became the Lich King and he got in touch with Kiel Jaden. In this reality, however, that never happened. This is a completely different Ner'zhul who's dabbling with the powers of the Dark Star, of the Void. And this never happened in our reality. So you have to wonder what kind of information are they looking for and what could this Ner'zhul possibly give them? Consider that he's not dealing with Kill Jaden or being the Lich King. You asked about the Ebon Blade getting Bolvar after Frozen Throne, and I didn't really read anything about this in this quest. Uh, all it says is that they're trying to unlock the secrets of Ice Crown, and that Bolvar uh, is perfectly fine with his fate. So, yeah, maybe you could interpret it as, as getting Bolvar out of the role of the Lich King, maybe getting rid of the Lich King altogether, but that's a little bit of a stretch. Either way, I would say that the Lunar Fall in and the quests that were given there, they're nice little reminders from Blizzard of characters from the past. It's Blizzard's way of showing that they didn't completely forget about these characters or these storylines. Besides that, though, I wouldn't give it too much value, but that's just me. Next question is from Restion Serpentine. Hey Noble, I'm a bit of an oddball and one of my favorite things to do is fishing, even though most people I know hate it as a chore. So one of my favorite characters is Ned Pagel, even from back when you had to bring him his tape measure and buy special bait from him. I would love to hear some more lore on his evolution and character development, what little there is admittedly. You're right when saying that there isn't a lot of lore behind Ned Pagel. Now, the first thing to mention is that he's named after a senior game designer at Blizzard Entertainment who's named Pat Nagel. And apparently Pat, he also enjoys fishing and drinking, just like this character. We find Ned Pagel play a role in nearly every expansion, and it's clear that he's the finest fisherman in the world of Warcraft. He even sells you this special bait that you mentioned, and when you return his measurement tape, you get this bait, and this used to allow players to fish up and kill Kasranka in Zuguru. Group. During the Burning Crusade, they added a quest in which Ned Pagel helps you out with taking on Tefir. Tefir, he used to attack Fedamor frequently because he was attracted to shiny lights, so they turned off the lighthouse at Fedamor and he stopped attacking. Years later, they came with the plan to reignite the lighthouse because, as you can imagine, there's a port there, ships not able to see it. That's kind of dangerous, and as they were trying to do this, they found an old book which spoke about Tefir. To make sure that this was a real thing and not just some fisherman's myth, uh, we were sent to talk with Ned Pagel, and Ned, of course, knew that this was the truth. So we prepared ourselves, we lit the lighthouse, and we took out the fear. Ned doesn't just sit on his butt and fish all day though, he was there during the Cataclysm to help us out with defending Sephiria's Roost in Mount Hyjal. And with Mr. Pandaria, he moved his fishing operations to Pandaria itself. And now with Warlords of Draenor, you can prove yourself worthy and you can bring Ned Pagel to Draenor to help you fish your garrison or send him away on your missions. Now that's basically what Ned Pagel has done in the story, but there are two more things that are definitely worth mentioning. First of all, you can find Ned in the Caverns of Time where he's fishing with Hel McEl in Old South Shore. There's nothing special about that, of course, it's Ned Pagel fishing, but the conversation that they have is rather interesting. Apparently, Ned Pagel, he's having some weird dreams about possible futures. In one of them, there's the Prince of Lordaeron who turns evil and kills his father. One dream is about Tora Mill that falls to undead forces. One is a gigantic demon that's killed by a bunch of floating lights. And of course, we know that in the future, these dreams become a reality. So for some reason, Ned can predict, or at least dream up the future. Now you could say that this is just Blizzard putting in a little easter egg and, and you wouldn't be wrong but apparently this character can do this so yeah maybe he has some sort of you know powers to see the future. Prophet Ned Pagel? Who knows, man? But another interesting thing is that there was an item back in Classic that caused a whole bunch of speculation. This item was called Ned Pagel's Guide to Extreme Angling, and you could find this book, and nearly all of the story was missing except a few lines at the end. And so, that's where you'll find the legendary sword of the Scarlet High Lord, Ashbringer. Ain't it amazing what you run into in an ordinary day of fishing? A legendary sword called the Ashbringer. Naturally, everybody wanted to get their hands on this weapon, and because of this, this book, because of this little line, some people believed that you could somehow find it with fishing, or that you could get Ned Pagel to help you out, or some way, somehow, you were able to get this weapon. Of course, eventually, all the rumors and speculations and mad theories were killed when they actually added the corrupted Ashbringer to the game. But for a little while, a whole bunch of people were tricked into fishing with the hopes of getting a legend. And that for now is Ned Pagel's storyline. 
Moving on to the next question, Elias Delgado asks, I have a bunch of questions about the game, but mostly about Classic WoW. I've been a Classic Raider from the start, and I've been wondering, who is Hakar? We see him in a sunken temple and a Zul group, but not much I could find on him other than he is a god. If more information could be found on him, that would be appreciated. Love your vids, keep it up, smiley face. Now, Elias, keep in mind that troll lore is not my strong suit, since not a lot is known about it. That's why I'm so excited about those comics that I mentioned at the start. But I have done some research, and this is what I found out about Hakar the Soul Flayer. Trolls are one of the ancient races of Azeroth. They were around far before the Sundering, and some sources suggest that they were even around before the Titans arrived. When the Sundering happened, so after War of the Ancients, where the land of Kalimdor split apart, the trolls were in a bit of trouble. Their kingdom, it was broken, and in their desperation, the Gurubashi tribe, it sought aid from an ancient mystical force. This force was Hakar the Soul Flayer, a blood god, a so-called Loa. Loa is a term used by the trolls for ancient powerful creatures that were around before the titans, and this particular one, this Hakar, it required blood and souls. In exchange, he did empower the Gurubashi tribe, and this allowed the tribe to conquer most of the area that we call Strangleform Vale, and even a few islands in the South Sea. By making these sacrifices, the Gurubashi trolls, they empowered Hakar, and as he grew stronger, he started to dream of gaining access to the physical world so he could devour the blood of all mortal creatures. Over time, the Gurubashi trolls, they realized that Hakar was no good and they turned against him. They actually managed to take out the avatar of Hakar and they drove out his most loyal followers, known as the Atalai. They drove them out of Zul group and they nearly killed them all, but a small group survived and they are still loyal and dedicated to Hakar. They built the Temple of Atal Hakar in the Swamp of Sorrows, where they worked on bringing back their fallen god. Word of their plans and word of building this temple, it reached the green dragon aspect Yasira, and she struck out and she destroyed the temple, sending it to the bottom of the lake. Several green dragons, they were left behind to guard the temple so that no one could get in, but unfortunately, some of the trolls, they survived the attack and they continued their work. This is the part where we come into the story, and since you played during Classic, you might remember that the Temple of Atal Akar, also known as the Sunken Temple, it was a little bit different back in the day. A quest giver sends us on a mission to collect an egg and contain the essence of Akar so that nobody can use its evil against us. Unfortunately for us, this quest giver, this Ye Kinai, he deceived us, and with the egg, they were able to bring back Akar in Zul Group. The trolls, they tried to bring down Akar themselves, and they sent in a few of their most powerful for priests. But these priests, they fell to Jindo, who used his magic to turn the trolls against the allies. And so instead of taking Akar out, they actually started to serve him. At this point in time, we went into the raid, we took out the priest, we took out Akar, we brought back his heart to Moltor in the hopes that the Zandalari would be able to find a way to destroy the heart. For a long time, we didn't really hear a thing about Akar until the Cataclysm. Our kind faces extinction. Trolls once ruled the mightiest empire this world has ever seen. Yet look at you now. Zuldrak has already fallen to the scourge. Its gods consumed as death descended on its people. Zulfarak, once the shining jewel of Tanaris, is now nothing but a wasteland. Divided, you are weak. But we, Zandalari, can offer you a future undreamed of. Jindo of the Gurubashi, would you see the greatness of Zul Garub restored? Join us, and the Zandalari will make it so. The Kara of the Amani, summon your followers to Zul Aman. Together, we will make Zul Jin's murderers weep for mercy. Brothers! Hear us now! We, Zandalari, have returned to reclaim the former glory of our people. To see trolls retake the lands that are rightfully ours. And to crush any foolish enough to stand in our way. From the wreckage of the Cataclysm, the Troll Empire will rise again! Vol'jin of the Dark Spear, you would turn your back on your own people? The Horde is my people. 
If it be war you bring, then I stand against you. So be it, Dark Spear. But against the powers we'll soon unleash, none shall stand for long. The Prophet Zul has showed up and he's trying to unite all the remaining troll tribes into a powerful force to take back the world that once belonged to them. Vol'jin of the Dark Spirit tribe, he wants nothing to do with them, so he steps away and Jindo has come back from the dead and is now using his powers not to serve Hakar, instead he's draining the spirit of this primal blood god. Now, have a taste of Jindo's true power! Your deceit is unforgivable, Jindo. You spit in the face of a god. Again, we go into Zul Group and we take care of business. We take out the resurrected or newly recruited priest. We liberate Hakar and Hakar utterly destroys Jindo. You overstepped your bounds, Jindo. You toy with powers that are beyond you. Have you forgotten who I am? Have you forgotten what I can do? Insects, I will deal with you another time. Afterwards, Hakar brings us back to our realm and he says that he'll deal with us at another time. Who knows if he might see Hakar again? Perhaps we'll visit the story once we see King Rastakan and the sinking golden capital city of Zandalar. Who knows if we'll see Hakar again? Which brings us to the final question of this Q&A, and I've kept this question till the end, since it does contain some spoilers for Warlords of Draenor. If you don't want any spoilers for Haimal or for Cho'Gal and whatnot, if you don't want to hear my speculation, let me just say thank you very much for watching, and please turn off the video right now. Alrighty, the final question is from Double O Dragons Double O. Hey Noble, during the mythic Imperator fight, Cho'Gal shows up, and when you kill him, he says... He comes. Who could he be referring to? I don't think it's anyone from the Burning Legion due to him breaking ties with Gul'dan. What are your thoughts on who it could be? It's a very good question and of course I don't have a solid answer, this is all speculation. Now I've done a more detailed video about Cho'Gal during the Wars of Reno Beta and I'll definitely link that down below in the description. The short version would be is that we first see Cho'Gal as he serves Gul'dan and Gul'dan sends him to Nagrand to get the powers of the Naru. Cho'Gal, he recruits the Pale Orcs for this mission and he manages to get his hands on the powers of the Naru. This turns the Naru into a void creature and at that point Cho'Gal he figures that he has enough power and he refuses to serve Gul'dan any longer. Instead of following Gul'dan's plan, he takes his forces and his new powers and he decides to attack Haimal. Most of you have probably seen him stuck in the cage since the ogres of Haimal were able to capture him. We fight with Karka Bladefist and somewhere along the way Cho'Gal he liberates himself and he shows up. Cho'Gal? <laughs> you sought to imprison us, Morgok! You could never control us! Guards, stop him! Destroy them all! Raise this city to the ground! The stones will be ours! All shall fall to darkness! Seal the gates! Protect the palace! Hymal will never fall to the light Come of here, you, you scrawny grabbers! Cho'Gal is after some stones and throughout the rest of the raid you'll see the ogres fighting the pale orcs. Now I haven't found a solid reason for the pale orcs why they are pale, but so far it looks like they're pale because they've been living underground. I could have missed some information about this, there could be a source behind it, I just wasn't able to find it. Regardless of that, Cho'Gal he makes his way to Imperator Margok, where he only shows up on the mythic difficulty and then he dies. I'm really sad about this, I'm really sad that they play such a major part of the lore only on the high difficulty uh, but it isn't the first time that this has happened and you know for those still unaware Cho'Gal he kicks the bucket at the end of Haimal. The voice file or at least the things that he says at the end that you mentioned in your question they sound like this. He comes. You can never escape. Like I said there is no solid answer yet uh, but 
as you mentioned it, it seems unlikely that it's still the Burning Legion, considering that Cho'Gal, he stepped away from Gul'dan, I doubt that he'll play nice with people like Archimonde or Kill Jaden. Old Gods are often a source behind corruption, and we know from our reality that Cho'Gal was willing to work with Old Gods. But so far, we haven't really seen the Old God on Draenor yet, and I personally hope that that won't change. So what's left at this point? In my opinion, one of the options is something that hasn't really been fleshed out in the lore yet, namely the, the Void. When a Naru falls to the dark side, it turns into a dark star, as the Shadow Moon Clan called it, and it gives access to void powers and becomes a void itself. We've seen this happen with Ner'zhul with the powers that he uses, Jogal seems to use the same powers. Like I said, not a lot is known about the Void. It is said that in the beginning there was light and there was void, and in a time long ago the two collided in the abyss of the Great Dark. As a result, Infinite Worlds it spiraled out into the newly forming cosmos. This is taken from World of Warcraft the magazine issue 5, so I would really like to see more information about the Void. Some have suggested that we might see a return of Dementius the Old Devouring, that this is the creature Chogal is talking about. Um, for those that don't remember, Dimensius is the one who destroyed Karesh, and he turned the Ethereals, the, the mummy creatures, into the energy beings as we see them today. Perhaps he is the being that Shogal refers to, or perhaps it's something entirely different, perhaps there's a massive source of power that we never heard about before, who knows, but I'm very curious to see where the story in Warlords is going to go. So yeah, like I said, I don't have a solid answer for you, but if I had to place my money on anything, I would say the Void and the possible lore that Blizzard can develop behind it. Whatever it is, that's me done for today, so thank you all very much for watching once again. Remember that you can always leave your questions in the comment section down below, and I might use it in the next video. I've also created a list with questions that I've already answered. The link to that list can also be found in the description. Have a great week, everyone. Subscribe if you like my videos, and until next time, guys, see ya!